Hey everyone, welcome to the first video for section 9.4. So in this video we're looking at is one of the main examples of a nonlinear system we can analyze using the method we talked about in section 9.3. So this section is about competing species, and you have two species that would both grow normally, but they compete and they share resources, so they adversely affect each other's populations. So we're going to analyze it via the methods that we talked about in the last section, as well as some new thing that we're going to talk about in this section. So let's go ahead and jump right on into it. So this section is about competing species. And the idea is that we have two species, they each grow following logistic model, or at least they would if they were growing on their own, but they are negatively influenced by the other by the presence of the other species. And so maybe you can think about this is they are two species that are sharing a food source. So if there's more of one of them, there's gonna be less food for the other ones to eat, and vice versa. So if they're sharing a food source, then they're sort of competing over this resource, and that's where you get this sort of setup here. So what kind of equations can we get out of this interaction? So we get something like this, dx dt, so x is the first species, equals x times epsilon 1 minus sigma 1x minus alpha 1y. Now that we're thinking here is that epsilon is something like our normal growth rate. Sigma is going to factor in the carrying capacity, right? Because what's the logistic, logistic model is dx dt equals rx times 1 minus x over k. So in some sense, the sigma is incorporating the carrying capacity into the equation, and then alpha is going to determine how much they interact, so some sort of interaction parameter. And similarly, we get dy dt equals y times epsilon 2 minus sigma 2y minus alpha 2x, where again, epsilon is the growth rate, sigma is the carrying capacity part, and alpha is the interaction between the two species. So as you can probably guess, the values of the different constants, epsilon, sigma, and alpha 1 and 2, are going to affect how the solution behaves. And so we, we want to look for critical points and stuff based on this, and it's going to depend on these constants, whether or not they exist and where they are and that kind of thing. But we can sort of use another tool to help us get there a little bit faster and sort of see what's going on in the equations beyond just critical points. And that's the idea of these null clines. So what we mean by a null cline is a line on which one derivative vanishes. So right, if I have a critical point, I need both derivatives to vanish. I need both dx dt and dy dt to vanish to get a critical point. But the null cline can give us a line on which one derivative vanishes. And then the idea is that on top of everything else, intersection of null clines gives critical points. Because if the two of them intersect, then they are both zero at that point. So let's look what we get for this equation. So for our x null clines, this is where our x derivative is zero. We get x equals zero, which is not too interesting. And the other one, which is, sigma 1x plus alpha 1y equals epsilon 1. And then for our y null clines, we get y equals 0, and sigma 2y plus alpha 2x equals epsilon 2. So these guys are both lines, which means we can sort of draw them on a graph and see what happens. So let's look at a possible option for what a graph we can get out of this. So I'm going to have my axes here. Again, since we're doing populations, I only care about the first quadrant. All right, so on this axis, let's draw our null clines. So I'm going to draw the x null clines in red and the y null clines in green. So these will be in red. These ones will be in green. So for red, I have x equals 0. Well, that is this vertical line here. And I'll have a slanted line here that goes from... Well, if x equals 0, then y equals epsilon 1 over alpha 1. And if y equals 0, I get x equals epsilon 1 over sigma 1. So it's going to be some sort of slanted line down this way, depending on the parameters epsilon and alpha and sigma. I'm not going to label the vertices, but that's kind of what the idea looks like. Then in green, I get the line y equals 0, which is the horizontal line here, and another slanted line based on these parameters again. Now, where do I get critical points? I get critical points where a green null client intersects a red one. So I get a critical point up here, I get one down here, and I get one here. Now, what the null clients tell me is they tell me where certain derivatives switch sign. So I know if I'm up top here, both dxt and dyt are negative. Why? If I look at the equations, scroll back up for a second, then if x and y are really big, then both derivatives are negative because this term here is going to make the whole thing negative for x and y really large. So I know we're there. Now if I pass over a y null cline, my y derivative changes sign. 
So when I pass over, instead of going down and left, I'm going to be going up and left. And I switch the X, now I'm going up and right. So look at this kind of picture. What I should be seeing and what I think I'm going to see is that this guy is going to be stable and these guys, other guys are going to be unstable. Because near them I'm going away and I'm going to the other ones. Now the idea is that if we do our analysis from the last section, we'll be able to see that we do in fact get this sort of condition where the one in the top left is going to be stable, the other one's that's not stable, the other one's going to be unstable. Now there are four different options for these these lines based on what the parameters are. Right? I get this picture here, or I get these three that I'm going to put down here right below it. So there's the three different types of intersections I can get, and it will turn out that all of them give you different types of behavior for your functions. One of them is going to be actually have a stable point at the middle, the other ones are not. So the idea is that if I can draw these null clones, I can get an idea of what's going on before I actually try to analyze my system, and then I can verify my analysis with the system after the fact. So the intersection null clones give those critical points, and they can analyze via the methods from before to sort of see what we actually get for the stability and stuff of those critical points. So the next video is going to be an analysis of a certain example using this using both methods, this and the actual breakdown analysis. There are already two examples in the book, so definitely go look at those as well, because those will give you more sort of guidance and more examples to go through to figure out how this all works. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one for the example.